Almighty Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I ask that you strengthen my, my understanding of the things that you've laid on my heart this morning. I ask that you uh, send angels to be with us to help strengthen our ears and our understanding. Uh, Lord, I ask that you be with everyone that's listening online. Help them to spread the light in their communities that you're coming soon to take us home. I ask all this through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you're just joining us, we are going through the book, The Sanctified Life. And when I say we, it's been a process of months, I think, at this point. And we're about halfway through The Sanctified Life. We've had some guest speakers that have been in between. Uh, we are in chapter 6 of the book, The Sanctified Life. So if, if you need a copy, let me know afterward, and we'll see if we can get you a copy of The Sanctified Life. We'll be in chapter 6 this morning. So I'd like to start by summarizing where we are to this point in that book. So... Brother Flickinger began, I'll wait for the tractor trailer to go by, Brother Flickinger began our series on the sanctified life by reminding us what John said regarding those who are perfecting Christian character, uh, that they'll never indulge the thought that they themselves are sinless, and that the nearer they approach the perfection of character, the more deeply they feel their own defects. Uh, Brother Flickinger also el elaborated on the understanding of justification and sanctification, if you remember. So justification is where God delivers you from the penalty of sin. And sanctification is where God delivers you from the power of sin. So God can give you the victory, is what he reminded us. Uh, Brother Nelson continued the series by laying out growth in Christ. And we had our, our corn plant to help us remind us of that growth. Uh, he reminded us that there's a need to grow up into Christ. We don't want to stay a spiritual baby and spiritual babyhood. Uh, but it can be difficult to start to grow. So he laid out for us that we leave behind things that are unhealthy and take up new and better ways of living both physically and spiritually. I like the illusion I think he made of a, a church full of babies in diapers. It's, it's everyone's nightmare, a pastor's nightmare. <laughs> uh, he reminded us that the solution to spiritual diabetes is exercise. Spiritual diabetes solution is exercise, including working to lighten others' burdens, feeding the hungry, and working in a very personal way to glorify God. So Brother Mills then reviewed the dangers of intemperance and eating and drinking, the need to bring the concepts of a, sanctify, a sanctified life or sanctification into our daily habits was brought forefront. Uh, but we were encouraged by Brother Mills that it's not impossible. It's not an impossible standard that we strive toward, but it's something that we can be established through solid daily practices that build up our character. So through God's strength, he reminded us we can be more than conquerors. So true Christian character through integrity can shine as a light in a darkened world. Brother Hamer, uh, as he shared, we're put here for a purpose. You and I are here for a purpose. And finally, last week, Brother Hillman shared that when considering the sanctified life, the influence you can have when sharing Christ through how you live, through how you work, and how you pray can be enormous. The testament, the testament is that God can vindicate his holy character through you and your life, and it's a very powerful reminder of the very personal calling that we're given. So if you're contemplating how you can grow in Christ with some of those reminders, I'll point back just a few minutes ago to Pastor Chris saying on the 18th of September, are we all going to go for a hike together? We're going to take a nap. We are going to do what? We're going to do something that makes everyone uncomfortable, a lot of us uncomfortable. We're going to go door to door. We're going to share what God has given us with the person that's right across the street there, the guy that heard that bell, the big, really loud bells between the services, that looked out his window and said, what are they doing over there? And then Mike Schrader knocks on the door on the 18th, and he says, hey, I'm from that tent over there, and we're building a church. I want to tell you about something really exciting that's happened to me. The Lord Jesus Christ is in my life, and he's changed me for the better, and he can change you too. Right, Mike? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry to pick on you, Mike. So as we open uh, chapter, we'll be in chapter 9, if you want to get your Bibles out, chapter 9 of Daniel, we're discussing Daniel and his approach to the sanctified life. So Daniel's approach before God led him into a part of his life where God not only honored him by preserving his life, keeping him safe, but unveiled to him mysteries that had been pondered for generations before him. 
So Daniel chapter 9. When you're there, say amen. So I know that you've gotten there in your app or your, your physical Bible. All right, that was about a third of you. I'll wait just a little bit longer. I've kept a marker in there for myself. So as we open chapter 9, which actually takes place just before the story of the lion's den, we find that Daniel has engaged in studying the prophecies. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 2 is where we're starting. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So the first thing I want you to notice is that Daniel, who lived a sanctified life, was blameless before God. What was he studying? He was studying prophecies. He was studying prophecy. He was studying Jeremiah specifically. But he was studying prophecy. So the first clue that I glean out of that verse is that if we want to live a sanctified life, what's something that we can do? We can study. And what specifically can we study as we start to grow into the giant corn plant? (laughs) As we become a full... We can study prophecy. That's right. Do we have any prophecies that are relevant to us now? So he was studying the 70-year prophecy from Jeremiah as he was studying regarding the fate of his people in prophecy in accordance with the prophecy that was revealed to him, we can study the prophecies revealed to us. So Daniel studied 70 year prophecy in application to his people being released from bondage. During the time of Christ, people were studying Daniel's 70 week prophecy in relation to the coming of the Messiah. And we can study the second coming prophecies that apply to Jesus returning soon. Jesus returning soon to come take us when the Lord returns to fulfill his promise to the people. So the next part of Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 9, uh, I want to focus on the prayer. Uh, but I want to do it in the context, Daniel was praying an intercessory prayer. And it was in the context of seeing his, the tribulations of his people through prophecy. So I want to focus on the, the aspects of prayer in a sanctified life. But think about it in terms of prayer to you and where you are and where we are in earth's history through prophecy. So Daniel was motivated by seeing the troubles to come onto his people to go to God and petition heaven on behalf of his people. So that my sermon title there is Petitioning Heaven. It's something that we can do too, just like Daniel did. So let's read on in Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. And I said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. So as Daniel opens his prayer, his intercessory prayer, the first thing that I notice is that he pays close attention to repeating the name of the one to whom he is praying. Sounds like a small thing, doesn't it? To repeat the name of one to whom you are praying. Repeatedly, he uses some Hebrew phrases. I am not a Hebrew scholar. (laughs) I work at a university and have access to a lot of Hebrew scholars, so I asked them some questions this week. Um, He uses the phrases, the Lord my God, or O Lord, and Lord God. He pretty much leaves no doubt into whom he's praying, right? So whom we can petition heaven. So the three Hebrew words that are used there are Yahweh or the Lord. Uh, Yahweh can be translated as the self-existent or eternal one or the one who is faithful. Uh, Second, he uses the word El or God. I actually like the word El in relation to God because it it shows that he's mighty and powerful. It's a very strong word. The key word there would be power. The last one would be Adonai. Adonai is translated as Lord. God is the sovereign ruler of the universe and he's a personal God. So if we put all these names together that he's using, we have the image of a God who's faithful, a God who's powerful or strong, and a God that has our interests at heart, a God that has purpose for us individually and collectively. So to the person that's seeking to live a sanctified life, I encourage you, I encourage you, when you pray, know that you have a God that cares about every facet of your life. We have a God for every facet of our problems, our trials, what we're going through. There's a There's God who sees and cares about all of those things. So, I would like you in your sanctified imagination to think back to a time that you've had in prayer. The time when you spoke to God with your heart open. So you opened everything, you were vulnerable toward God. So for me, 
there was a lot of times that I've drawn near to God and he's drawn near to me. And I spent a few hours this week uh, looking through prayer journals and old emails that I had and discussing with my wife. And I realized about halfway through that, that I was seeking for that amazing answer to prayer where Gabriel swept down from heaven and this huge mountain was moved on my behalf. And I could share with you this powerful testimony of what God did in my life. So something spectacular and dramatic, and I didn't find it. <laughs> um, a lot of you have those stories, and I praise God for the mission influence here at South Bay. Our missionaries, a lot of them, come back with those stories, but that is not my personal testimony. My personal testimony I would like to share with you. Um, in the context of sanctification, isn't, in the context of being more like Christ, isn't every little aspect of character development a miracle in itself? Isn't every little thing that God let you go through in your life doesn't that add that as your character, isn't that something that, that God has miraculously worked on your behalf to fit you for heaven? So in my life, I'm going to try to get through this. <laughs> my life, my testimony, uh, there was a few moments where I knew that God was working in my life. There's actually way more than a few. But uh, this specific one, a few years ago, my wife and I found out we were expecting our second child. Expecting our second child. So we found out we were pregnant and our hopes got even higher. We went to the doctor and they said, I found two heartbeats. There are two heartbeats. All right. And then the doctor came in and said, there's something abnormal. All right. There's something abnormal. We'll need to talk about it. That was on a Friday, I believe. And we'll talk about it on Monday. So what do you think we did all weekend? We were praying, but we were kind of agonizing what's going to happen. So we lost our second baby. That was the abnormality. We lost our second baby. And we found ourselves receiving the news from one of the coldest and most heartless doctors I have ever met. <laughs> and uh, I don't know his name personally. I hope he's not in the audience. <laughs> um, I don't think he is. But uh, I found myself in a tiny room with this cold and heartless doctor receiving some of the most upsetting news I've ever had. And I'm sad to say that my selfish nature got the better of me, and I've ex expressed this to my wife. I've never felt like hitting someone so badly in my entire life, <laughs> the way, the manner in which this man spoke. And so he stepped out of the room, and uh, we kind of squeaked. We weren't, we weren't at that point doing a lot of expository Bible reading or flowery petitions to God, but what we did manage to squeak out was just a small request to God. But we know that he heard us. And the reason we know he heard us is because a nurse walked into the room after the doctor had left, and she said, uh, I wrote her, her words down here. One of the first things she said was, I heard how he spoke. Do you want me to make sure he never, doesn't come in here again? <laughs> I know that sounds like a small thing. It's a very petty thing, but it was an answer to the very tiny little prayer my wife and I were able to squeak out, asking God to do something in the middle of that trial. She said, she sat down with us. This nurse sat down with us. She said, I know what you're going through. I had a miscarriage myself a few weeks ago. God set, set that whole thing up to have an answer to prayer, speaking comfort into our lives. That faucet of God, the comforter, was there in our life in that little tiny moment, in that little tiny room, somewhere on gun barrel. So what relief and comfort she was to us, I don't think she'll ever know. But, uh, but God knew. God knew what was happening in our lives. Through that whole experience, we discovered there's this whole underground community. I'm sure some of them are in this room that uh, people that had suffered in silence through miscarriage, um, through the loss of a child, and they just kind of stay quiet. They don't tell anyone. They grieve to God in their hearts. And uh, we were able to connect with that community through grief. So I'm sure we at South Bay are familiar with grief, especially in the past couple of weeks during COVID. Um, my, Bible, my Bible this morning, I left at home and I took my wife's Bible. And uh, my wife's Bible has an inscription that was given to her by, uh, by Edward Witt. So I'm reading out of Edward Witt's Bible that he gave my wife. He said he wants to see her in heaven. And he gave her this Bible to remember that. And it reminded me of the very powerful grief that we're all going through. But I encourage you, as I've been encouraged in my testimony, through that grief and loss, start to look around you. As you start to pick your head up, as you start to look around at what's happening through that grief and loss, we start to see that, that 
there are prayers being offered for these family members suffering grief and loss. There are people that are coming into churches that have never been in a church in their life. We were at a uh, service last week, I think, for uh, Christy Beeson, and the church was packed over at Apison. Lots and lots, hundreds of people. There were thousands joining online, and they got to hear powerful testimony, raw testimony about how God is working in the lives of some of these saints that have fallen asleep in Jesus. They got to hear, for the first time, some of them, what a Seventh-day Adventist message is, the belief that Christ is coming soon, and that those who are dead asleep in Christ will rise first. They got to hear that for the very first time. That is a miracle. That's a miracle. It's through grief, but it's a miracle nonetheless. So that's part of my testimony, is allowing God to strengthen my resolve in the Seventh-day Adventist message through prayer and Bible study to live a sanctified life, to learn more about him, to grow up, because my time on earth is short. Hopefully all of our time on earth is short and Jesus will come soon. So I encourage you, whatever problems you're facing in the stress of COVID, in the stress of war, and heartache, the things that are getting too much for you, I encourage you to go to God. Go to your knees in prayer early in the morning. Wake up early. When God tugs on your heart and says, you should be up, I need to talk with you. And lay all those things that are troubling you, all those problems that you're experiencing at his feet. I encourage you to do that. So let's uh, continue in Daniel chapter 4, verse 9. Daniel's praying to a great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. Daniel turned to the God of righteousness in verse 7, of mercy and forgiveness in verse 9, of law in verse 10. He is the God of majesty, of holiness and infinity, yet he's approachable and he's caring and he's loving. He's the God of heaven, and this actually means a lot to me now. He's the God of heaven and the God of earth. He's a God that cares about the things that are up there that are righteous and holy, but he cares about the things we're doing here too. Daniel knew his God personally, intimately, and experientially. Had an experience with God. Therefore, his prayer reflects that. His prayer is direct. It has no shade of fear or hesitancy. He comes directly to his father. It's like a friend conversing with a friend or a child asking a parent for clarification. If you have children... <laughs> My children ask me constantly for clarification. Hey, Dad, uh, I got a question. Um, How much my son was making bread yesterday? And I think he was asking his mother for clarification. How much to put in of this? How much to put in of that? And how much to put in this? And she had the directions right there in front of him. (laughs) That reminded me of someone. (laughs) Hey, God, uh, I'm just curious. How are we supposed to treat our neighbor? I haven't been able to find that. I haven't been able to find that. How do we treat our neighbor? And God says, well... I have the recipe <laughs> if you want to look it over a little bit. Hey, God, are we supposed to uh, forgive anyone? I mean, if we did, if I didn't really like them, how many times should we forgive them? And God says, well, we have the recipe. If you want to look it over, I'll help you. But I want, to, I want you to look at the recipe too. Let's continue in Daniel 9, verse 5. My apologies, Jeremiah. <laughs> it was good bread. Daniel chapter 9, verse 5. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled. Even by departing from your precepts and your judgments... Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. So notice here again that Daniel, a man that was found blameless in the sight of God, was identifying himself with a sinful and wicked people on whom God was pronouncing judgment. So we see in Daniel here the type of Christ. His life was pointing forward to the coming of the Savior, just like Jesus did the same when he was on earth. He condescended, he took the form of a man, Jesus, even though he remained sinless, he identified with us, a sinful and wicked people. He petitioned heaven on our behalf. So a word of caution. I want to give you a word of caution. When you're petitioning heaven, prayer is not a game of you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. God is not, and I praise him for this, God is not a pagan deity that's itching for our apologies. He doesn't want your shouts of misplaced praise. He's terrible in his judgment and tender and gracious in his mercies. So he waits for us. He waits for you and I to come to a transparency with boldness, vulnerableness, and trust. So as we come, Daniel's prayer suggests that we do two things. The first is acknowledging our sinfulness. He said, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled. 
The word sin there suggests we missed the mark, right? And rebellion is a deliberate rejection of God's commands. That definition of sin has stuck with me. I think I got that uh, around the time of my baptism. The Pastor Stephen Wall, I hope he's not listening, but Pastor Stephen Wall, I think he's retired from Maryland Conference. Uh, he's the pastor that baptized me, and he stuck in my head that sin is separation from God, separation from the holiness of God, from God's commandments. Uh, sin is, at its core, rebellion. So he continues there, Neither did Israel listen to God's servants. And in, I found in 17 of the verses in chapter 9, Daniel refers to the sinfulness of Israel 14 times. The sinfulness of Israel. So he reveals the gravity of sin and the need for confession and the importance of repentance. So the second thing that Daniel did there was acknowledge our predicament in the face of God's holiness. Where are we in relation to the holiness of God? So prayer, I was reminded there, is speaking to God as a friend. We've heard that. But that does not make God our equal. Prayer is speaking to God as a friend, but that does not make God our equal. So I'm reminded here of an oft-quoted verse, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. And in the context of that verse, it was to discuss what Caesar is owed, what Caesar is due, what Caesar has done. But what about rendering unto God what is God's? What is God's? What is owned by God? God? God is due the honor and the glory for being willing to send his son to die in our stead. Only God is due that. So we render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Think about my tax bill in my pocket. But we render unto God what is God's. I think about the bill for me, the bill for my salvation. That's right here. So let's continue in verse 7. Daniel chapter 9, verse 7. He said, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off and all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, belongs us, belongs shame of face to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. So when you petition heaven, when you come to God in prayer, do you feel the shame of face that belongs to someone who has separated themselves from God? You ever felt that? A shame of face. There's a sentiment right now in popular Christianity, we'll call it that, that one should never feel ashamed when standing before God. So Daniel's prayer suggests quite the opposite. And before you rush up here and try to correct me, <laughs> Daniel, when petitioning heaven, owned the shame that was brought by unfaithfulness to God and God's commands. So the key with shame, the key with shame though, and the guilt that's associated with it is to take action. All right, so when you start getting watered, our little corn seed, and you start feeling that sunlight, the corn plant doesn't just go like this and say, I will be a corn seed for the rest of my life. I'm a really good one. I'm going to stay like this. What does it do? It grows. Yes, it grows. It starts to grow. I can bring it back out again if you want to see it. Really nice big corn plant. <laughs> That should be encouraging to you in your life. When you feel that shame and guilt, go to God. Go to God and say, hey, I understand what I am. I understand that I'm a sinner. And I'm seeking God's forgiveness and grace. That facet of God, God's forgiveness and grace. So if you feel that guilt and shame, take action. Take action on it. In Steps to Christ, page 30, we're reminded of the state of our fallen condition as we petition heaven. Where are we in relation to heaven? The poor publican who prayed, God be merciful to me, a sinner, that's Luke chapter 18, regarded himself as a very wicked man, and while others looked upon him in the same light. But, and praise God there's a but in here, but he felt his need, and with his burden of guilt and shame, he came before God asking for his mercy. His heart was opened for the Spirit of God to do his gracious work and set him free from the power of sin. The Pharisee's boastful, self-righteous prayer showed that his heart was closed against the influence of the Holy Spirit. Because of his distance from God, he felt no need of, or no sense of his own defilement in contrast with the perfection of divine character, divine holiness. He felt no need and he received nothing. So there are two kinds of prayer then, the prayer of form and the prayer of faith. The repetition of set customary phrases when the heart feels no need of God, that is formal prayer. We should be extremely careful in all of our prayers to speak the wants of the heart 
and to say only what we mean. All the flowery words at our command are not equivalent to one holy desire. The most eloquent prayers are but vain repetitions if they do not express the true sentiments of the heart. But the prayer that comes from an earnest heart, the prayer that comes from an earnest heart, when the simple wants of the soul are expressed, just as we would ask an earthly favor from a friend. Hey, Mike, can I borrow your, uh, your cart? Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Ask an earthly friend for a favor, expecting that it would be granted. That's the prayer of faith. That's the prayer of faith. The publican who went up to the sinner to pray is a great example of a sincere, devoted worshiper. He felt that he was a sinner, and his great need led him to an outburst of passionate desire. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So Daniel concludes his prayer. Daniel chapter 9, verses 18 and 19. 18 and 19, he said, Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your people and your city and your people are called by your name. So realizing the greatness of God's mercy should be at the forefront of a sanctified life. Because without God's mercy, I have no hope. Without God's mercy, you have no hope. I praise him, though, because he's offered me way more than I deserve. 1 Peter 1, 1 to 3. 1 Peter 1, 1 to 3, if you'll turn there. Let me know when you get there. Thank you. One, 1 Peter 1, verse 3. My apologies, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is unper imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This section is for South Bay. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do we feel a little tested, church? Just a little tested right now? May it result in a sanctified life. May it result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I want to draw out of Daniel's prayer here the extreme importance of intercessory prayer and how it played in the lives of the Israelites in captivity. So Daniel prayed that God would intercede on behalf of his people and that God would draw near to them and bless them. Back in Daniel chapter 9, verse 19, he said, O, o Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, listen, and act. The author of the sanctified life points out that in answer to this petition, Daniel received not only the light and truth which he and his people most needed, but a view of the great events of the future, even to the advent of the world's Redeemer. Those who claim to be sanctified, while they have no desire to search the scriptures or to wrestle with God in prayer for a clearer understanding of Bible truth, know not what true sanctification is. So Daniel talked with God, and heaven was opened before him. But the high honors granted him were the result of humiliation and earnest seeking. All who believe with their heart that the word of God is true will hunger and thirst for a knowledge of his will. God is the author of truth. He enlightens the darkened understanding and gives to the human mind, I praise God for this, he gives to our human mind the power to grasp and comprehend the truths which he has revealed. That's great hope for me. <laughs> While the condition of physical Israel was dire, while Daniel was praying for his people. It made me wonder how much more does spiritual Israel need that same forgiveness and healing. So I praise God for his gift of Jesus to us. I praise God that Jesus is our brother, that he lived a life for intercession of, for us, and that Jesus prayed for our condition. Uh, John chapter 17, John chapter 17, verse 14, if you'd like to turn there.
Jesus prayed for us. He prayed for our condition. He said, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the, your truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. So the sanctified life, then, is one in which heaven is petitioned. Heaven is petitioned, claiming the great truths that are laid out in Scripture. As our conversation becomes deeper and deeper with God, as more and more truths are laid out to us, as we start to grow, we pull off more and more of that old man and become fit for heaven. As it says in Joel 2, verse 12, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. I encourage you, South Bay, turn to God with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. So it all starts with prayer. It all starts with petitioning heaven. It all starts with opening up to God, with a belief and understanding that the God of Daniel, the God who, whom Daniel prayed to, is the same God that we can pray to. The Father to whom Jesus prayed is listening to you and I right now. Praise God for that. God tells us then in John, continuing, Now this then is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything, in our scripture reading, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Our God hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we ask of him. As our musicians come up, I'd like to conclude with a quote from the book Sons and Daughters of God. You, South Bay, and listeners online, you are the agent to be to whom God will speak to the soul. You are the agent to whom God will speak to the soul. Precious things will be brought to your remembrance, and with a heart overflowing with the love of Jesus, you'll speak words of vital interest and import. Your simplicity and sincerity will be of the highest eloquence, and your words will be registered in the books of heaven as fit words, which are like apples of gold and pictures of silver. God will make them a healing flood of heavenly influence, awakening, conviction, and desire. And this is my, best, my favorite part. Jesus will add his intercession to your prayers and claim for the sinner the gift of the Holy Spirit and pour it upon his soul. And there will be joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. So as we remember Daniel's prayers on behalf of his people, as we come to Jesus who lives as our intercessor, let us remember to be bold in petitioning heaven. Time is short. Time is short.